This was a man who was really the godfather of heroin in Ireland. The tsunami of, of heroin suddenly hit Dublin. It went from bad to disastrous overnight. Some of the kids were robbing their mothers, their fathers. There were syringes on balconies. This was a life and death issue for an awful lot of people. The guards were never going to give up. Every detective has a case that's never left them. Young people were dying, communities were devastated. He was a mercenary. One that shaped their career. Nobody had been employed in an undercover capacity, working in drugs. It was a dangerous, challenging environment. A case they can never forget. All roads led to Larry Dunn. Inner city Dublin in 1980. A tight-knit community suddenly torn apart by a brand new epidemic. Today, our government recognizes that we may have as many as four and a half thousand heroin users in Dublin city. You'd inject yourselves on stairways, anywhere, gardens. It's chaos beginning to happen on the street. Some of the kids were robbing their, their mothers, their fathers. It's a living hell. You hang out in squats. You You'd eat out of dustbins. You would literally do anything for drugs. The individual addicts felt isolated, hopeless, and were prepared to die knowing they had no other route. The one man who started this heroin epidemic was Larry Dunn, a professional criminal from a family of professional criminals. The Dunn criminal gang were what we would now call probably a local Irish cartel. They were the only real gang in town. They were quite powerful, they were very violent, and they were quite ruthless. The drug squad knew Larry Dunn because he'd had more than 30 convictions, and there were four brothers in particular from the family who were working together. Larry Dunn was the biggest of them. He ran the biggest criminal network of importation of heroin. My name is Michael O'Sullivan and I'm a former Assistant Commissioner for Mangarda Siakona. I joined the Guards in 1977 and in around 1979 to 80s I was a young detective operating in Dublin City out of Dublin Castle. Michael joined a team tasked with cracking Ireland's heroin trade and bringing down Larry Dunn. Prior to what they now call the heroin epidemic, the drug scene really was mainly hippies, and a small trickle of hard drugs. The tsunami of, of heroin suddenly hit Dublin. The police weren't prepared for it, the communities weren't prepared for it. It went from bad to disastrous overnight. Heavy, heavy drug deal was going on. Many people died, um, families were destroyed and communities were ripped apart. Brendan O'Brien, former journalist with Today Tonight in RTE. Brendan produced an investigation that, for the first time, showed Ireland the effect Larry Dunn's heroin was having in Dublin. The drug scene that I'm describing and that the programme revealed was totally unknown to the wider public. About two-thirds of Dublin's heroin is brought in by the big commercial pushers. One group in particular controlled most of it. Heroin was so widespread, it was growing at such a pace that there was probably about 5,000 serious heroin addicts. What was clear to me was, when I talked to these people, that they wanted their story told. I guess hell on earth for anyone that goes on heroin now. Life is fucked, finished. The more I talked to people and looked at what they were doing, the more I realised that this was a life and death issue for an awful lot of people. I doubt we'd ever get on. So what do you see up ahead in the future? Dying. <laughs> Nobody knew anything about heroin and heroin sales in 1979, including the criminals. It was just a completely new phenomenon. Open dealing in the flat complexes and on the street corners, their kids going to school, looking at dealers who were supplying heroin to their children, who were attracting other criminals and other drug users. 
learning curve for everybody. You learned on the street, and the people on the street learned on the street. The drug squad at the time consisted of a sergeant and seven or eight men. I realized how fast the problem was growing. Michael now began to study this new criminal underworld and the man at its heart, Larry Dunn. Larry Dunn was part of a very large family from the south inner city, born into an Ireland that was, you know, grindingly poor and his particular background was especially poor. The family brought in an income by selling clothes on a stall on Francis Street. Because their father was involved in crime, their uncles were involved in crime as well. It was more or less inevitable that the Dunn boys would also become involved in crime. And they became quite well known to the guards from an early age for carrying out things like stealing cash and shoplifting. And of the 10 Dunn boys, all of them bar two ended up in various reform schools. Larry himself spent uh, time in a reform school in County Offaly. And really by the 1970s, they ran a very well organized robbery gang. And um, that was their main occupation. From the late 60s, early 70s, uh, there'd been an upsurge in northern related crime. Initially, you had paramilitary groups robbing banks and other sources of, of income, but then ordinary criminals realized how easy it was, so they got in on the act. So you had an upsurge in armed robberies in the 1970s, and detection rates fell quite dramatically. Larry Dunn seized the opportunity to cash in. Larry Dunn and his criminal gang were responsible for a lot of bank robberies, jewelry robberies. They would travel throughout the country committing crime. But armed robbery became an increasingly risky business. One really influential event occurred in 1980 when two Gardaí were shot dead during an armed robbery in Balahadreen. At that point, a lot of resources were put into the guards and the guards were told that they had to clamp down on these armed robbery gangs. The Gardaí managed to get their act together and they set up an emergency response unit. Those units could respond within literally three or four minutes to a report of a, a bank robbery. So more and more people got caught robbing banks and penalties increased. So people began to move into other areas of activity which were less risky. Larry Dunn needed a new way to make money and events unfolding thousands of miles away gave him the opportunity he needed. As Gardaí began to clamp down on armed robbery gangs all over Ireland, um, two very significant events took place internationally. You had the revolution in Iran and you had the Russians invading Afghanistan. The aristocracy there, who owned vast wealth, turned their wealth into something that would make them get their money out fast. They turned it into heroin, they sold it in Europe, and Europe was flooded with heroin. So conditions were really perfect in that sense for Larry Dunn and his group who were transitioning really from armed robbery into the drugs trade. Larry Dunn at the time and his gang had connections with the UK and he saw the profits that were being made. In around 79 to 80, he began with a number of associates to bring heroin into the Irish market. Larry Dunn knew exactly where he wanted to sell it, in Dublin's inner city, where he grew up. My name is Mick Rafferty. Since the early 70s, I've been a community activist, mainly in the north inner city. I grew up in the Docklands in Sheriff Street, which was a complex of flats. The docks were booming. My father was a docker. His grandfather was a docker. But there was a, a very sudden change with containerization in the 60s. Within the space of a very short time, there was total, almost total unemployment. Well, you had to work, there was other men outside to take that job. You had to pick out your own way of living in life. Otherwise, you go hungry. The state seemed to adopt the attitude that people were in the way of progress. That was the cause of a lot of issues that arose, a lot of alienation of communities, particularly disaffected youth, who were still behaving, to some extent, as if they could leave school and get a job. So they were young, 
vulnerable and ripe for manipulation by criminal elements. Now Larry Dunn flooded the flat complexes of this vulnerable community with heroin. In the early 80s, it was one of the central places where they sold heroin. And dealers came from all over the city to sell drugs here because it became known as, as, as the place. Children saw addicts shooting up on the balconies, the stairs, even the playgrounds. They come to the flats because the main supplies was there. We have seen these addicts come in here in the middle of this playground and the young children here and have been injecting themselves. My name is Anne Buckley. I grew up in Fatima Mansions during the 80s and 90s. In 19, I started smoking heroin. It was a difficult time. The women and the families, their minds were consumed with the chaos that was going on, all the drug dealer. Michael O'Sullivan and his colleagues in the drug squad struggled to police these communities. The big challenge was that because they focused in the inner city of Dublin, they used flat complexes and lookouts. It was very, very challenging, very difficult to get up close and personal to identify who the dealer was and seize the drugs. Complexes were a favorite spot because most of them were built around a central square. Teresa's Gardens, uh, for example, or Hardwick Street Flats. It's almost like a theatre, you know, you've got these apartments, you've got balconies, and people can look out and chat to each other. You've also got very few entrances, so it's very easy to keep an eye out if the Gardaí are coming along, for example. They became more innovative and more strategically placed in what you would call mini fortresses with steel gates and steel shutters and windows. It was clear to Michael that Larry Dunn was responsible for the unfolding heroin epidemic. But gathering enough evidence to arrest him was a challenge. Dunn's nickname said it all. Larry used to say, Larry doesn't carry. He wouldn't carry the drugs. Larry doesn't carry, he had everybody else carrying. Cracking Larry Dunn's drug dealing ring required a new type of detective work. For the first time in Irish drugs policing history, guard the detectives were to be sent undercover. They decided that one way of dealing with it was to pretend to be addicts. And then once they bought it, they could nab the person selling it to them. And they were called the Mockies because they were mock addicts. Nobody had been applied in an undercover capacity working in drugs in Ireland. Myself and the people that I worked with had the advantage of the local knowledge. We were from Dublin and we understood the local geography. I was young and small and skinny. I was just an average guy, so I just blended in, I guess. You were dropped in the deep end with the people you worked with and told to make the best of it. It was a dangerous, challenging environment. Michael posed as a drug user and hit the streets of Dublin. You went out to infiltrate groups and figure out where the drugs were, who was selling them, how much of it was around. It was about putting the pieces of the jigsaw together, figuring who was who and where the money was coming from and where the money was going and how the heroin was getting in. In dealing with drug dealers, you had to be convincing. You had to look like you needed heroin. You really to be on your guard for a change in the mood of the situation. You want gay, right? Just go up to a flat, right? And you just bring up your money, right? And you can get it straight away like that, and then you just go out and use it. Two or three minutes is a long time to be on your own in any location. In those days, you did this type of work without a radio, without a firearm, so you had nothing to sort of protect yourself. So frequently you would meet drug dealers, and so you frequently found yourself in a back alley off some side street. Backup was really no good to you because they wouldn't find you in that space of time. You took certain risks and it became an occupational hazard. When a move was made to arrest them, some of the people I worked with were assaulted quite badly, stabbed with syringes, got their hands scarred, pieces of flesh bitten off. In the ensuing struggle, violence was just part and parcel of, of, of what went on. 40 years on, 
Ireland's modern drug squad owes its existence to Michael's team of Mockies. Angela Willis, Detective Chief Superintendent at the Garda National Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau. The basic principles that were developed back then by the original drug squad have grown to what we have today here in this covert bureau, which is the Garda National Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau, the Mockies. I think they demonstrated a desire to tackle the issue and a willingness to acknowledge that this was a significant issue that wasn't going to go away without an appropriate response. Every day Michael spent undercover as a drug user revealed more about the mechanics of Larry Dunn's heroin operation. His customer base had greatly increased because the more heroin he sold, the more people got on heroin. The numbers of addicts had, had greatly increased and he was making greater profits. He would allow them use heroin for free, they would run up debts, and he could force them then to go on these courier trips to various parts of Europe and bring his heroin back into Ireland. He then used the same tactic really when he was starting off drug dealing. He would give potential customers of his free drugs and because he knew that once they took the heroin once or twice, they'd very soon get hooked and they would be back again and again. There were also very few other people dealing heroin at that time. So his investment in that young person by giving them free drugs, that investment really came back to him rather than going back to, you know, some other rival drugs gang. Larry Dunn had Dublin's inner city in his grip, but Michael's investigation was about to reveal a fatal weakness. I think they got comfortable and they got complacent. There was a strong chance he was smoking heroin. It made him more catchable. In 1980, inner city Dublin was in the grip of Ireland's first ever heroin epidemic. It was chaos. The kids were robbing their, their mothers, their fathers. There were syringes on balconies. It was masterminded by local criminal Larry Dunn. He ran the biggest criminal network of importation of heroin. Young detective Michael O'Sullivan was sent undercover to infiltrate Dunn's drug ring. You did this type of work without a radio, without a firearm. So you had nothing to sort of protect yourself. Larry Dunn destroyed thousands of lives in Dublin city. Meanwhile, he built himself a lavish lifestyle. He wore very expensive clothes, Armani suits, soft leather shoes. When he was in his pomp, he was making a lot of money, estimated to be about £10,000 per week at one point. And he really embraced this whole lifestyle of the wealthy gang leader. He drove luxury cars. When he was banned from driving, he was able to employ a chauffeur. Today, the Criminal Assets Bureau gives the state power to seize wealth from known criminals. But in the 1980s, it had yet to be established. Despite Dunn's long list of convictions, his huge wealth was beyond the reach of Michael and the Gardaí. We had a huge disadvantage. If a guy was caught with 20 grand in his house and you couldn't say that was from dealing, well then he got the 20 grand back. It's as simple as that. And if he bought a big car and he never worked in his life, Larry Dunn, to my knowledge, in all the years, I never knew him to work. These people flaunted their wealth in, in a community that was devastated. Again, that only heightened the feelings that these people were making money from the misery of, of, of and the suffering of their kids. Larry Dunn's heroin now drove a surge in other types of crime, as addicts broke the law to fund their new drug habit. They only did two things. They went out to rob, to make money, to buy drugs, to inject themselves when they got it. How much a day does it cost you to feed your habit? Probably a hundred pounds. Well, where do you get a hundred pounds a day? I couldn't say that. <laughs> It would take a uh, hundred quid a day to feed your habit. So you can imagine the, the extent of the criminality that that generated. With drugs, you had people, particularly young people, who were robbing from their own families. They were desperate for money. They'd rob from next door neighbor. They'd rob from elderly people, anyone that was vulnerable. Apart from money, what else did they steal from you? They took a... Uh, um... I, me shorts, me new shorts. People wouldn't open their doors. 
People were afraid to go to the shops. Elderly people were afraid. It was crazy. Like, it was scary. People were preying on each other. So it created huge tension in, in communities. People robbing the houses, flats, muggings. It was a, it's a complete desperation. People don't take the problem seriously until it hits them. I remember about six months ago talking to some of the families here, some of the parents, and they didn't realize the problem was going to start. Michael could now see how Larry Dunn's heroin dealers had infiltrated entire inner city communities. Some of them were quite brazen, like dealing from their flats. So what you'd have is a queue of people going in to deal. They would chew up on the stairways. The community responded by coming together to attempt to drive the dealers out. We had uh, drug addicts from everywhere. We just got together and said, like, enough was enough, and tried to do something better for the sake of our children that was getting brought up in the area. The concerned parents against drugs was an attempt to have a coordinated pushback against the drug pushers. What you're dealing with is children, and we're talking about children between 12, 13, 14, up to the age of 24 or 5, killing themselves. As we see people who are on drugs, mm. we're, it's only sinking mm. into it's our It's not until our, it actually it happens to you that you believe. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's too late. It was a mass meeting. People said what they thought. Names were given, you know, who was pushing, who was dealing, and it was agreed these people had to leave the community. One such meeting was organized by two anti-drug campaigners, Mick Rafferty and local politician Tony Gregory. Each year, over the last few years, 10 young people, mainly in the inner city areas of Dublin, have died from heroin use. And this year, already so far this year, 10 have died. One of the meetings in Rutland Street School, the man himself, Larry Dunn, came in, and I was chairing the meeting, and he stood beside me. And I can tell you, I was a bit nervous, you know. And he started plumazing the, the, the audience by saying things like, you all know me. I'm like yourself. A lot of you are street traders and dealers. So that's all I'm doing. I'm not doing nothing different from what you're doing. And Tony, who was in the audience, stood up and stood beside me. And he said, Dunn, Mr. Dunn, you're dealing in debt and chaos, and you should be ashamed of yourself coming from the same class of people as they are now destroying. When their prayers failed, the community took matters into their own hands. We would gather information, we'd invite them to a meeting to present the evidence and ask them to stop. And if they didn't stop them, we'd march on them. They had watched for years people on balconies selling drugs, kids dying, and nobody cared. We feel that shortly it will be impossible for a youngster to get through adolescence without encountering pressure to use drugs. You sympathized with the communities who were taking matters into their own hands. Sometimes they get misinformation, and sometimes they got it wrong. The trouble started this afternoon when a number of them occupied the house and barricaded themselves in. They say the house was being used for drug pushing. The family who'd been living there had to be given a guard the escort out of the area. But the community's rage at Larry Dunn proved vital to Michael's investigation. The communities were a great source of support because they knew what was going on and they knew who was selling. They knew where they were selling and in many cases they knew who they were selling for and they had no loyalties to these drug dealers and the local communities would say look the guy down the road has a brand new car now and he's moving house and he hasn't worked a day in his life and my kids are on heroin you just knew that these were the, the family that were known to bring in the drugs and the women and the men would be very angry at them don't fucking say hello to me you how fucking dare you you know the cheek of you to think you can say hello and everything's normal and this is what you're doing. So people came forward to tell you, what are you going to do about these guys? It was a source of up-to-date information coming from the communities. The communities weren't the only source of Michael's information. 
the dealers themselves showed little loyalty to Larry Dunn. If you look at the nature of the Garda operation, the information that it had, it, you know, knew where to find Larry's drugs and so on. And you would have to say that some of the men around Larry were actually supplying information to the guards. With this wealth of intelligence, Michael could now aim higher than the dealers on the street. Our aim was to work up through the channel of distribution to target where the main source of heroin was coming in to try and take people out at the top of the pyramid. Larry Dunn and some of his criminal associates, they have to be lucky all the time. We only have to be lucky once. And then Michael got his break when he discovered a weakness to Larry Dunn's operation that could turn the odds in his favor. A lot of mistakes that some of his people made was using heroin and it made them careless. One of his problems, and which really turned out to be his Achilles heel, was that every time a courier brought drugs back from Europe for him, he would test the drugs himself. He would actually sniff some heroin. Larry and the men who were close to him became hooked on drugs. I think there was an air of invincibility in their mindset, that the people on the ground will get caught, the people who live in the inner city will get caught, the people who are at the front line selling drugs and who are storing the drugs, they'll all get caught, but we're two steps back. And I think they just got comfortable and they got complacent. All Michael needed was for one of Larry Dunn's generals to make a mistake. One of the inner circle met with me and sold me drugs. He was later sentenced to seven years. It put them on the back foot. They started to make mistakes. And then it got to the stage that there were more of the inner circle caught than there were free. And it put them under increased pressure. They sort of became paranoid and it was a level of distrust among everyone they dealt with. He needed that network. He needed to be able to have trusted lieutenants. He was running out of allies. No longer was it a smooth, well-oiled machine. Drug addiction was finally undermining Larry Dunn's own inner circle. Michael could now build a more detailed picture of how the gang operated. The heroin trade worked in, in the form of a pyramid. Somebody at the top of the pyramid, a senior figure, Larry Dunn, who gave the orders and coordinated the sale of drugs. He had his people in Amsterdam and his people in London and Birmingham, where they had close contacts with the people who were bringing the heroin in from Afghanistan and from Pakistan. He would arrange the price through his close associates. Couriers would bring the drugs in. Somebody who would be very trusted would meet them. They would cut up the drugs, give it to dealers on the ground who had one foot as an addict and another foot as a dealer. They were selling to feed their own habit and they would then pass the money on to the guy at the next tier. He in turn would give it to the guy at the next tier. He would send it up. It would eventually get up to the money man and the money and the profits generated would be used to bring in more drugs. But what Michael really needed was evidence to link Larry who doesn't carry to the actual possession of drugs. Gordy got their chance. Intelligence said drugs were being stored at Dunn's family home in Rathfarnham. All roads led to Larry Dunn in those days. On the day of the search, the detective sergeant had got a drugs warrant to search Larry's house in Rathfarnham. Simultaneously, a jewellery robbery had taken place and the serious crime squad believed that the jewellery may have been in Larry's house. So the serious crime squad arrived to search Larry's house for jewellery and a half an hour later the drug squad arrived. When Gardy raided his corporation house they found heroin, cocaine and cannabis resin. There was a cocktail of drugs found there. There was £60,000 worth of heroin, cocaine and cannabis found in a pillowcase in his daughter's bedroom. For Larry Dunn this was a rare but crucial mistake. And there was a number of other bits and pieces and cash found, but more importantly, the heroin was found and therefore there was evidence that he could be charged with. It's very rare for somebody at the top of a pyramid to be in possession of the drugs. I think Larry was so busy at the time trying to coordinate everything he was doing. 
You could say he dropped his guard. It was great for the ordinary people who, who saw this guy on a pedestal, proving that crime pays. And that was what he frequently said. And a lot of young criminals saw him as a role model. It was a game changer for the young heroin industry that Larry, who doesn't carry, was caught. Larry Dunn was charged with possession of drugs, but the laws at the time meant he was released pending his trial. One of the frustrating things for the communities, they couldn't figure out how guys were getting arrested and they were back on the street the next day, but that was the bail law. He realized that worst case scenario, he might go to prison. He needed to make as much money as possible to build a nest egg. He was on bail for the best part of two and a half years, during which time he accumulated huge sums of money and increased his activities. He reorganized his criminal enterprise. He then decided that he needed to relocate. He was able to buy a house in Sandyford. He was able to pay with that with cash. No Dublin criminal in the past 20 years had managed to put money aside like that and move up and move out. So he bought Gorse Rock, which was a beautiful location overlooking the Wicklow Mountains. It was a little bit like a fortress. It was going to be more difficult to get to him, but it wasn't over till it was over and the organization was running a very profitable enterprise and they weren't going to go away that easy. Dunn ramped up his operation he expanded from the inner city into South County Dublin, bringing the drug epidemic with him. Not only are we talking about something that is, if you like, in tough working class enclaves, this was much more widespread than that. Dunleary, like other parts of the city, has witnessed a heroin epidemic. Young people dying without the public really knowing. He would have controlled, I would say, about 90, 95% of the heroin trade people from the outskirts, interacting with people from the inner city, were trying out this drug. And, and the tragedy was this, people start using heroin, it's next to impossible to get off it. So his trade just mushroomed. I watched my friends for years. I saw how long it took them to get addicted. I woke up sick, my body started shaking. You can't sit in your own skin. It's like spiders crawling all inside you, but yet you're sweating, you're vomiting, you're soiling yourself, um, and you can't, you can't control it. So the, your normal bodily functions have been taken over by a substance. So if you don't have that substance, that opiate, you can't function. You're not living, you're just existing. It's, fil it's a filthy world. At a human level, Talking to a pregnant woman or somebody who's injecting themselves, endangering their lives, was very hard to watch. But professionally, it was exactly what I wanted to be able to show. Now, that sounds a bit hard, but I wanted people to see the true reality. In 1982, Dunn was still on bail and local politician Tony Gregory fought to make Dunn's drug epidemic a political issue. The community is certainly playing its part and will continue to play its part to destroy the heroin barons, as they're called. He and Mick Rafferty secured a meeting with Taoiseach Charles Hawhey and demanded action. And we gave him the results of what was called the Bradshaw Report, which indicated that 10% of young people over the summer had become addicted to, to heroin and it was spreading. And we, we gave him the name of the people, the Dunns, that we thought were primarily responsible, Larry Dunn in particular. And Hoddy picked up the phone to the then commissioner, uh, Patrick McLaughlin, and said, Patrick, I want you to do something about this problem. And I want it done urgently. I don't want any delay. And he put it down. And he just said to us, no, lads, we'll get some action done on solving this problem. Once Tony Gregory went to Charlie Hawhey and complained about the heroin epidemic, the Garda efforts were really ramped up then into the men around Larry Dunn. A lot of surveillance was carried out on them. People who would courier in drugs for them from abroad, people who would sell the drugs on the streets. 
So you really have this sense of the net closing in on Larry Dunn. Dublin, 1983. For three years, a heroin epidemic has engulfed the city. 10% of young people over the summer had become addicted to heroin. Gardaí know the man responsible. All roads led to Larry Dunn. He would have controlled 95% of the heroin trade. And now they have the evidence to bring him to court. There was 60,000 pounds worth of heroin, cocaine, and cannabis found in a pillowcase in his daughter's bedroom. In April 1983, Larry Dunn faced trial for possession of the drugs found at his home in Rathfarnham. Larry Dunn went on trial before a judge and jury in the Central Criminal Court in Dublin on charges relating to the possession and supply of illegal drugs. There was a lot of media hype and pressure in relation to the trial. He was eventually coming to court. At the time, a conviction required all members of the jury to agree on the verdict. At the end of the day, the jury failed to agree and the jury were discharged and another date set for a retrial. So Larry was free to go about his business until the next trial. There was a lot of speculation that people may be intimidated. The guards who worked on the case always believed that Larry Dunn had actually tampered with the jury. The jury were novel, basically. And that was one of the reasons why it was so important to get him and send him down from the Gadi point of view, from everyone's point of view, because otherwise, if these people are allowed to become a law unto themselves, well then, you know, the legitimacy of the state is on the mind. Before he went on trial again, the law was changed and the courts were able to accept majority verdicts then from juries. And what that really meant was, it meant that organised crime was less able to tamper with a jury. By the time the second trial came along, the pressure had greatly intensified by community groups, a lot of media pressure. This was one of the most important criminals over the last number of years. The game was probably up at that point, and he really knew that. It became very clear to him on day one of the trial that the evidence against him was just overwhelming. On the first day of his trial, Dunn was granted bail to go for lunch. And the fact that he got bail during his trial, to many people, was beyond belief. And it is beyond belief, because he had a track record as long as both your arms and legs. He hatched the plan, and that plan was to abscond. He was able to, you know, walk out of the court during lunchtime, go for his lunch. He got changed in the toilets in the pub, and really that was all he had to do. He was gone. He had been in court to hear prosecuting counsel open the case, but after lunch failed to return. There was outrage that he was let escape, and there was disbelief that he was let escape. But they essentially looked everywhere for him. They arrested about 40 people, raided about 40 houses, looking for Larry Dunn. They weren't able to find him. The search for him became nationwide, and police forces in other countries were also asked to look out for him. Despite intensive efforts to find him, Larry Dunn remained at large, and community anger was growing. We just couldn't understand how he was given bail. You know, extraordinary. And that was sort of flying in the face of justice. I remember one woman saying these dealers are going to sleep on, on silk sheets while my daughter lies on a marble cold slab in the morgue. Where's the justice? It was really embarrassing for the guards. They put in a huge effort over a period of several years to try and catch him and his gang. The embarrassment grew and the anger in political circles grew when the guard effort to find him failed. Um, my personal views were that he would be caught because um, the guards were never going to give up. The investigations were never going to give up. He would be away for a while, but sooner or later he'd surface, and when he'd surface, we'd bring him back. It was difficult to convey that to the communities who felt cheated again. For 100 years, he should have got right up and over. A lot of them, yeah, and anyone belongs to him. Larry Dunn had disappeared, but the destruction he caused was all too visible. For the wider audience, the Larry Dunn story was the story. But underneath that, 
The addiction continued and the horror stories continued and it was still getting worse. There was probably about 5,000 serious heroin addicts. Families were wiped out. Like my auntie lost four of her five children, all under the age of 30. Another neighbour lost five out of seven of their children. My boy was carrying for them all over at 12 years of age. This is your boy now who's an addict? Yes. So much potential lost to the person, the families, the community. Ireland, so many gifted, talented, really, really smart people died from the heroin epidemic. It's unnatural. It's on a scale that um, I may never fully get over. This was a man who was really the godfather of heroin in Ireland. 40 years on, there are still thousands of heroin addicts in the country. Really the same areas that Larry Dunn targeted are, are the ones that have the worst heroin problem now. Almost two years after he disappeared, there was still no sign of Larry Dunn. But Michael's instinct said he would resurface. Larry was a homebird and he was a dub. He was laying low, assisted by trusted associates in the suburbs of Dublin. Gardaí did everything they could to make life for Dunn as difficult as possible. In his absence, he had actually gone on trial. He became the first person in the state to be convicted in their absence uh, before the Central Criminal Court. Now a convicted criminal, Dunn took his cash and fled Ireland. Larry ended up going to Spain. He hung out in places like Fungarola, Marbella, Malaga. He lived a lifestyle like the way a tourist would. He spent a lot of time on the beach. He exercised very regularly. He swam in the sea. He went for jogs very often. He also hung out in Irish bars quite a bit. He actually went from Spain to Thailand to try and kick his heroin habit. He underwent a treatment program out there. But as one of Ireland's most wanted men, Dunn's fugitive lifestyle couldn't last. And he was getting off a ferry at one point over in Portugal. A police officer checked his passport, suspected it was fake, took him into custody and raised the alarm. And when the Portuguese police checked with the Irish police, they obviously realized they had a big fish on their hands. They caught Larry Dunn. Back in Ireland, it wasn't just a prison sentence waiting for Dunn. There was fury. Dunn was led out of the court, flanked by a dozen uniformed guardi and several armed detectives. The crowd shouted abuse and threw eggs, and at one stage, the gate of the courthouse was slammed against the Garda van, causing minor damage. Those days, it was a sense of satisfaction to the people in the inner city, albeit limited satisfaction, because they still had children who were heroin addicts, some of whom have died, their families were, were destroyed. It was poor comfort to them. I mean, we genuinely believed that once you got a few of the key dealers, the problem would ease. It was certainly a significant moment but I knew with Larry Dunn gone, he'd be replaced and we'd have to rebuild the investigation to focus on the next Larry Dunn. The roots had been laid. To celebrate Larry Dunn being out of the picture was short-lived because other dealers simply emerged. And unless the cause of the problems are dealt with, you will get the reincarnation of the Larrys. There's plenty more Larry Duns around, and we, everybody will have to stand together and root them all out. That's, That's what I say. If you focus so much on getting the big dealer and putting Mr. Big away, it creates the illusion you've solved the problem, but of course you haven't. Miss Big gets replaced by a lot of little guys who make it even harder to get on top of the problem, and some of whom will eventually become big themselves.
No one knew this better than Dunn himself. When Larry Dunn was being led away to start that 14-year prison term, he turned to journalists and said, if you think we're bad, wait till you see what's coming after us. And really, uh, you'd have to say now that he was proven right. He anticipated his own legacy by that phrase, that if you think I'm bad, you want to see what's coming. But he created what came after him. The next generation were more cunning, certainly, probably smarter. They had learned from the mistakes of the predecessors and they had learned how to hone their skills in trying to avoid the police. Throughout the 90s, these new gangs became increasingly violent, even assassinating an innocent journalist. It was really only when Veronica Guerin was shot dead that we accepted, I think, as a country that we had a serious organized crime problem. And that was the big wake-up call for the state. They realized that these guys are not just a threat to the working class communities, they're actually a threat to the foundation, you know, of the state. As generations went on, they became more violent. People then started to get shot and contract killings, and it became more professional, more violent, more global, more sophisticated, and they became more wealthy. The scene in Dublin's north inner city of the ladies they may have discovered the murder scene so far cost 18 lives. involved in drug trafficking and violent crime. The drugs trade then just really took off from the late 1990s. It was all types of drugs that had spread to all kinds of areas all over Ireland. And people of all the social classes were taking, you know, heroin, cocaine, cannabis. We have too many crime gangs now to even name them all. The drugs trade has really spread all over the country and the world has changed quite significantly from the time of Larry Dunn. Larry Dunn was released from prison in 1995 but the law wasn't finished with him yet. Larry Dunn displaying very visible signs of wealth. There was nothing they could do about that at that time. We didn't have legislation which allows for the confiscation of assets. They didn't have legislation specifically enacted to deal with the drug situation. In 1996, the Criminal Assets Bureau was set up to confiscate the proceeds of crime. The first thing that the Bureau did was to really target people like Larry Dunn, those old time guys who had, you know, built up property portfolios, who had, you know, large sums of cash in the bank. That kind of, you know, lavish lifestyle, you know, high roller, being chauffeured around in an expensive car and buying a house in Sandyford for cash, that was all taken from him. Larry Dunn died in May 2020. He was aged 72 and he had been suffering from cancer for quite some time. His health was very poor and really his personal circumstances were very poor indeed. He was actually living in a shed in his daughter's garden during the last years of his life. Anne was in addiction for 17 years. She found a path to recovery following an attempt to take her own life. And that's when I took charge of my life back. I knew I had a lot of work to do, so I went into detox and treatment, trauma-informed treatment. I feel alive today. There's education today that I can avail of that I, I never had the opportunity. It wasn't there. I feed my brain and, and I give myself knowledge. That's what I do today. For those who witnessed it firsthand, Larry Dunn's legacy is one of death and destruction. My abiding memory is doing the interview with the guy shooting up, looking for a vein to put the needle in, and basically killing himself. He pioneered organized drug distribution in Ireland. It was never there before. He put a structure on it. He brought in the product. And from that, people saw the market and followed on. His legacy is a whole generation of young people who were lost. And if you go down to the memorial down in Buckingham Street and the Christmas tree at, at Christmas time and you see all the names of, of kids who have died are put up on the tree, that's Larry's legacy. Larry who doesn't carry killed people. And his legacy is the grief of mothers 
and fathers, of course, who lost their kids because of drug addiction. Young people were dying, communities were devastated. He was making profits. He was a mercenary. The people who worked with him were mercenaries. They didn't care.